on that system, we as taxpayers pay something into an innovation fund that rewards the medical innovators, but we also benefit as patients by getting access to medicines at much lower cost, which will reduce our insurance premiums, our cost for the national health system, our cost for foreign aid, where also often medicines are being bought. So we are paying for new medicines, for innovation, in a different way, and thereby make it possible for that innovation to be rapidly diffused so that pretty much immediately after it comes on the market, the medicine is really available and really accessible even for poor people. And if you make that system global, then it's even better because the cost of innovation is now shared around the world. All the governments in the world are contributing to the innovation fund and so each one needs to contribute less. The cost of inventing a new pill is exactly the same regardless of whether it is used only in Korea or whether it is used all over the world. And so everybody benefits, the whole world benefits and the cost of the innovation is spread among human beings all over the world uh, through all the different governments, all the different tax systems. And so the cost becomes quite small. Mm -hmm. Now this same system that we have developed for new medicines can also be applied in other areas. It can be applied, for example, with new seeds that are more high yielding, higher nutrient yields, and also for seeds that need less fertilizer and less pesticide or maybe no pesticide and no fertilizer at all. The environmental harms that are done by pesticides and fertilizers are very substantial and if we can encourage innovations, new plant varieties that do not need fertilizer and pesticide, we can make a very big difference to the health of our planet. So again, here we can say uh, it would be very bad if the cost of innovating, of developing such new plants were put, were rewarded through an increase in price. Because then the new plant varieties would not be used. People would still buy the old vegetables, the old grains mm -hmm. that are not free from pesticide and fertilizer because they're so much cheaper. Poor people cannot afford to pay uh, plants that are grown without pesticide and fertilizer if such plants cost twice as much or three times as much as ordinary plants. So, but if we reward the innovation through the tax system and give innovation rewards on the basis of pesticide use avoided, fertilizer use avoided, then we can make the new plant varieties as cheap as the traditional plant varieties that need fertilizer and pesticide. So the basic idea is then that encourage the development of new green and clean technologies in agriculture but also elsewhere with power plants, with factories and so on, cars. We encourage the development of such new technologies in a way that doesn't impede the rapid spread of these technologies. We do it by having a very good reward for innovators, but a reward that does not raise the price of the innovation. Because the reward does come out of a markup that is added to the innovation, an artificial monopoly, but the reward comes out of tax monies and is conditioned on the quality of the intervention, the invention. It's the achievement that the innovation brings in terms of emissions reduced, mm -hmm. pesticide, fertilizer, CO2, what have you. And in that sense, it really rewards each innovation according to the actual value that it produces. And the actual value here depends not only on how good the innovation is, 
but also on how widely the innovation is used. A wonderful new car that doesn't emit a lot of greenhouse gases is a nice innovation, but if nobody uses it, it doesn't help the planet. So we want the car to be used, we want the car to be affordable, and so and we want the innovator to make a real effort to make sure that the car is used by many people. And so we pay the innovator on the basis of the actual reduction in emissions that his or her innovation achieves. And on that principle, the more of these new cars or the more of the new innovation is being used around the world, the more money the innovator gets. And so who will incentive? There's an incentive to make the innovation as good as possible so that the reduction in emissions is as large as possible or the health impact as large as possible and also an incentive to spread the innovation as quickly as possible to as many people as possible so that it has as much impact as possible. And that's why we call the system the Health Impact Fund System or the Environmental Impact Fund System because we reward innovators according to the impact that they manage to achieve with their innovation. I guess I should, I should make a disclosure here that, that Thomas is my advisor and the recent paper is exactly on this topic, on the Environmental Impact Fund. You've made uh, some very uh, serious comments uh, in the uh, academic field and in public about uh, global warming, you and, and, um, and others, and um, including John Weckert. Uh, I, I, want, I came up with something today on the BBC. Uh, they say the UN has just released a, re a major report on global warming. Uh, Richard Black reports green decline. Uh, this may be irreversible change already. So the kind of uh, project you're talking about is an immediate project. This is something that a time that time can't wait. Extremely important. Yeah, absolutely important. We have now coming up the Rio Plus 20 meeting in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. And I'm actually going there the day after tomorrow uh, to uh, also present uh, proposals and uh, make sure that everybody understands how urgent it is and that we can actually do something through this revision on the way we reward innovation to slow the change. But you're of course right, the molecules that have been released in the atmosphere will not be, uh, you know, they will be there for a long time to come. And so uh, global warming will be a reality. We find the oceans gradually heating up. We find the snow caps melting on both poles. And uh, the process is uh, quite dramatic and will bring uh, foreseeable and also unforeseeable changes to the climate. Uh, many species will go extinct and human life will become quite more difficult in many parts of the world, especially in the tropical regions and in the low-lying regions where rising sea levels will inundate a lot of land. You know, some whole countries are going to be uh, disappearing simply because the oceans are rising by two meters and they will simply be underwater. Quite a serious situation and you're right, you know, we have no time to lose. Let me ask you just one more question. Um, can we get some of your comments on the current economic crisis? It's gotten quite severe in Europe and right now you're in Germany. What are you seeing there? Uh, well, I see first and foremost a, a, an inability of the existing governance structures to take decisive action against the crisis. It's very, very difficult politically. Uh, the problem here is that the politicians who are currently in power want to be re-elected. They don't want to make any unpopular decision and they don't want to admit that they have been wrong. 
that they have underestimated the magnitude of the crisis and so on. And so if elections are coming up and elections are always coming up somewhere, then politicians are saying, oh, you know what, we are going to pretend that everything is all right and we're going to kick the can down the road. That's an American expression. We are going to kick the can down the road and after the election, we do something serious. But before the election, we pretend that everything is fine and just wait a while. But of course, that makes the problem very much worse. Financial systems are built on confidence. Confidence is the central currency of any financial system. You can see that in the very small scale. If you have a bank in a village and 500 people deposit money in the bank and save money in the bank, and then the bank makes loans to people. It lends money to people who need money to buy a new house, to fund education or a disease of one of their family members or something like that. That whole system can work very well so long as the depositors have confidence in the bank. But if suddenly the depositors lose confidence, they all rush to the bank and they say, I want my money out. I want to take my money out. And the bank, of course, cannot pay everybody back because the bank has lent a lot of that money to other people in the village. And so if the confidence collapses, the whole system collapses. The bank becomes unable to pay. And in the end, the entire system, the entire possibility of having a mutually beneficial system that makes sure that those with extra money get interest and those who need to borrow money uh, can do so at a reasonable rate, that whole system that is economically so valuable collapses. So, and this is what we have in Europe now. We have a confidence crisis and a confidence crisis that is uh, 